Good evening, everyone. This is Sandy with Animal Education and Rescue. It is Tuesday evening, and we are doing a very special live on getting a new dog or cat to adjust to a new home and, um, and all the things that you can do to ensure that the transition from one place to your place is a good one. Um, and so we're going to talk about that tonight and uh, I'm just going to wait a minute or so uh, to see who comes on board. In the meantime, those of you that are on, get the scoop um, about animal education and rescue. Um, Friday, the cat that was pregnant is actually having kittens as we speak. I just got a text message that the first kitten is out. Yay! So she is going through labor right now and... Um, and we are uh, anticipating that she will have had her kittens in the next couple hours and we'll be able to share that information to you. But so far, so good. I have Michelle, uh, who is the foster mom, doing a great job, and Julie, who is being her assistant, helping her with the delivery of the kittens. So yay, it's very exciting. So um, hi, Ashley. Thanks for joining me. Hi, Chalk. Let's see who else is on by. Hi, 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 Mercy. Good to see you too. And Anne, hi. Um, so this will be a good live, I think. And we're going to use this live as an educational video that we're going to put on our website. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Caroline. So good to see everybody tonight. It has been one heck of a day. Um, but of course, I'll catch you up on all of that on our Sunday night live at eight o'clock um, or maybe some other random lives that we do during the week. Meanwhile, um, let's talk all about a new dog or cat adjusting to a house. And I think it's a really hugely important topic. Now, why are we doing this now? Well, because in the last couple months, we've gotten a few returns, a few animals that have been returned to us. Um, and it really got me thinking that the more we can educate people about how to help an animal adjust to a new home, the better the chances that the animal stays in the new home. And so that is the goal. And I'm getting a text message as this is going on. And they just sent me a picture of the first kitten that was born. So um, that is really um, kind of neat. And I'm sure they're having an exciting evening watching Friday have her babies. Um, in any case, um, so we're going to kind of break this down to uh, dogs and cats. Um, because I think that's mostly what people end up adopting. And we're gonna start out with dogs and then I'll segue to cats. And so bear with me as we, uh, if you're more of a cat person, you listen about dogs. And if you're more of a cat dog person, you listen about cats. And what I encourage you all to do is to please, please, please share this video far and wide. And the more we educate people on animals, the better chances that animals are well taken care of and get everything they need and um, and there's no issues as far as them having to be returned or uh, a family uh, being totally stressed out by an animal that is not behaving themselves in a new home. So uh, really important stuff for us to talk about tonight. So. Um, Let's talk dogs first, and I encourage you to ask questions along the way, but um, let's do it this way because it can get distracting for me to look at all the comments um, or questions is um, I will ask periodically, does anybody have any questions? And then at that time, you can ask me any questions you want. It would be awesome. Uh, Vicki is here. Hi, Vicki. And Annie is here. Thank you, Annie, for grooming Mona today. I really, really appreciate it. Here, look, you guys. Do you see the cat? What? There's a kitty on my lap. Okay, so let's talk dogs first, okay? Can we do that? All right, so um, there's some, I wanna break this down for you. First of all, there's a lot of elements when it comes to how an animal behaves, how a dog behaves. The first thing we have to consider is the age of the dog, okay? Is the dog a puppy? Is it a newborn 
puppy? Oh, that's the best stage. And that's when people want to adopt puppies and they're like, oh, they're so cute and so sweet. And they're so much easier at that age. And then they turn into four, five, six month old puppies and they're much bigger and much more wild and more rambunctious. So that's the next stage. And then we have the young adult stage, which is really kind of a, you know, usually they're active and they're energetic. And then we have, let's say middle age, which is let's say three to seven or so. And that's usually a stage when a lot of dogs are at their best, um, we hope. And then of course, then there's our senior dogs that, you know, let's say age eight and up where um, they're a lot slower and, um, and moving slower and they're not, um, they're not getting into as much mischief at all and that kind of thing. So you've got age, you have breed type, okay? So you're gonna have dogs. I had somebody just the other day that really was a great way to describe it when she was talking about pit bulls. The woman um, actually is a dog trainer and she takes in dogs into her home and I, I was overhearing this conversation and she was saying that with pit bulls, she doesn't take in pit bulls into her home um, simply because when they play, they don't know how to quit. They don't quit. They don't easily quit. They just keep going and going and going. And that kind of makes sense. So, um, you know, when you're adopting an animal, um, you are getting either the, if it looks very much like a purebred or it's a mix of many different dogs, you're getting a lot of genetics that you are dealing with. So um, your new dog, if it's a Border Collie or it's a cattle dog like Lincoln and, um, and Pebbles, who we have now, the puppies, is you have to anticipate high energy. If you adopt a dog that looks like it's a Basset Hound mix, then you can anticipate low energy. Um, of course, Labrador Retrievers um, or Lab Mixes, you, you know, you can anticipate you might have some counter surfing going on. So know your breeds. Um, know what you're going to expect. Little Terriers, they could be feisty and they could be barky and yappy or they can, you know, uh, be very curious and get into tr mischief. Um, so know your breeds. So anticipate that when you're taking the dog home is how old is the dog? What's the breed type? Um, if you adopted the dog from a rescue organization or a foster-based organization, um, hopefully if it's a reputable organization that's you know doing a good job, they're trying really hard to do a good job, they're gonna give you all the information they can on the dog when it lived in a foster home to kind of give you a heads up of what to expect and hopefully give you the best possible match to your home, okay? So um, now uh, we need to kind of think from the dog's perspective. So um, the dog moves to your home and um, now depending on where the dog came from also makes a difference as far as what baggage it is carrying to your house. So if it is a dog that was in a foster home for a very short period of time, then um, the foster family is going to have limited information. If the dog was in a shelter environment, then the dog is totally going to be, you know, will have possibly changed by the time you get the dog home. And I'll give you a scenario um, to kind of drive that home, that point home. So my first adult dog that I rescued was from Orphans of the Storm in Riverwoods. His name was Mota, and he is the reason why I started Animal Education and Rescue. It was in his memory that I started it back in 2003. Well, Mona, we got, I mean, not Mona, sorry, got Mona on the brain. Um, Mota, um, we got when our, our oldest daughter was an infant, um, and she's going to be turning 29, so a long time ago. And at that time, um, when I saw Mota at Orphans of the Storm, um, he was in the cage and he was like a big furry black dog, um, but he was really quiet. He was really quiet and subdued. And I said to myself, I want a dog like that. He looks like he's easy. And he had been there for a while. I didn't know at the time that big black hairy dogs are hard to find homes for. Um, I just, I guess instinctually I always go for the underdog and I, we ended up adopting him and lo and behold he we take him home and find out that he is sick he is sick with a terrible case of kennel cough and he had these 
big snotty boogers coming out of his uh, nose and he was miserable and unhappy. We put him on, an on antibiotics and, um, and he got better from it. And guess what? He was so spastic. He was so hyper, he was into everything, he was an escape artist, he escaped my house, my yard, all the time. Um, he peed all on my kids' diaper bags and their toys and stuff, he lifted his leg. He drove me crazy. He was not an easy dog. Of course, I was like 22 years old and very inexperienced as far as dogs are concerned. I had grown up with a standard poodle um, who was just about perfect and of course I didn't take care of the poodle my mother did so I can't take credit for that at all so it was my first dog and he was a handful so that is an example of a dog that I went and saw and and just had this impression of him that was totally inaccurate totally inaccurate he was not like that at all and we had him 14 years and we um, you know, we had 14 exciting, interesting, exasperating years with Mota. Um, but that tells you, you don't know for sure when you get a dog. You just do the best you can to make an educated guess to pick the right dog for your home. Um, so the dog comes home and now the, there's some elements that you need to do to ensure that the dog... Um, continues to um, behave in a way that obviously benefits the house. The one thing absolutely hands down is important is that you need to either crate the dog or gate the dog or keep the dog in an area when you can't watch the dog. Because if you don't and you just give it run of the house, you are asking that dog to fail. Okay, because there is no way to know whether that dog is gonna be destructive, go potty all over your house or whatever. So the idea is, is the dog comes home and you have really like a lot of structure and so uh, set up a space in your house for the dog to, to live, like to have its crate and have its you know food and water bowl and um, slowly, slowly, slowly you acclimate the dog to the house. Um, and that could take days, weeks, months. And um, certainly when you leave the house and you're crating or gating the dog off, um, that may happen for a year, two years, three years. It depends on the dog. It depends on how old the dog is. It depends on how rambunctious the dog is. And the other thing, when you're planning the dog to coming home, if you say to yourself, well, I'm going to have the dog stay in the kitchen, and you got a Jack Russell Terrier mix, okay, and he's high energy, and you say, well, I'm going to put a baby gate up in the kitchen, and he's going to stay in the kitchen. Well, I can pretty much guess that that... Jack Russell, even though he's only 10 pounds, he's going to have a grand old time scaling that gate and getting into the other part of the house. So if, there, if in doubt at all that the dog could scale a gate, you want to crate the dog when you're not home. Also, when you get the dog, you want to make sure that you allow time for um, extra time for the dog. So um, don't get the dog on a Monday night at nine o'clock when you and your entire family have to leave, um, let's say it's 6.30 in the morning on Tuesday and, and you're gonna be gone literally nine hours and that dog's gonna be in a crate in an atmosphere he has no idea where he is and he's totally freaked out and totally confused. Not a good way to start things. Instead, you wanna make sure that you um, anticipate what your schedule is gonna be. Maybe take a day or two off of work or, um, you know, uh, obviously come home for lunch, get the dog on a weekend. Um, also, you know, that brings to mind too is what is realistic and how long you can leave a dog alone. If you're getting a puppy, if the dog is, uh, let's say, two months old, then the dog can, during the day, hold it for two hours, in theory. If the dog is four months old, it can hold it for four hours. Six months old, hold it for six hours. Okay, so that's the general rule. At night, they can usually hold it a little bit longer because all they're doing is sleeping. There, there's no food involved, there's no water involved, there's no movement around, so they can usually hold it a little bit longer. So if you're getting an eight-month-old puppy, okay, and, um, and you know, that is a really challenging stage. I call it the teenage years, and they can push your buttons and be difficult and be high energy and need a lot of exercise and so forth, is that I would highly recommend that you get that dog 
on let's say a Friday night if you're gonna have the whole weekend to be able to work with the dog and um, while essentially in theory the dog can hold it for eight hours I guarantee you in the beginning especially a young dog like that they're not gonna be able to it you know in the beginning hold it for that long so you want to make sure to anticipate that and make sure that you have someone that can go and take care of the dog in the middle of the day um, you know and and so forth right from the get-go okay so a dog being, I had somebody apply for a dog of ours um, and they applied for Jackson and they were gone nine hours a day. And, um, and she was unable to take any time off of work. She was unable to get a dog walker. And I said to her, I said, well, nine hours usually means 10 hours because if someone works eight hours, they have an hour and two break, or let's say half an hour lunch and two 15 minute breaks, there's nine hours, and then travel to and from work. So it could be up to 10 hours. And you get a brand new dog and you put it in a crate for 10 hours, not a good idea, okay? You're setting that dog up for failure. So instead, if you're gonna get a dog, even though Jackson is four years old, I know because I know we had him in a foster home where the foster dad left for nine hours a day to work and Jackson went bonkers and he destroyed the guy's um, blinds. He uh, went bonkers in his crate. You know, it was not a good scene. So we, we have to be really careful when it comes to that and mindful of, you know, how old the dog is, how long you're leaving the dog alone and so forth. Um, for um, many dogs, I would, you know, definitely right off the right off the bat, I would suggest lining up with a trainer or a training facility that you can reach out to if you need help or to sign up for group class if that's appropriate. Or a lot of people don't realize that there are in-home trainers. These are people that will come, I'm one of them. They're people that come into your home, they are trained to help you to um, train your dog and to um, to make the dog, uh, you know, as, as good of a family member as possible. The really great thing about having a, um, a dog trainer come to your home is that, um, is that the, the trainer can look at the layout of your house and help you figure out where to keep the dog. They'll get a visual of where the dog goes out to go potty. Um, they'll get a visual of, you know, the family dynamics in the family's environment and how the dog acts in its own environment, which is very different than how a dog is going to act outside of its environment. So um, having a dog trainer um, available to you to uh, come out to your house um, or if let's say it's like a three month old puppy to have a puppy socialization class, you know, where you do, um, you know, have the puppy socialize with other dogs, whatever. Um, it's really, really a good idea to line that up. Um, and do that before you actually take the dog home. That way you can pick up the phone and you can call that person at any given time and be able to get them out there to help you with your new dog and to um, make sure that you're doing things properly. Um, another thing too is creating boundaries for your dog right off the bat. Um, so you need to decide in your house, talk to the family and decide what are the rules of the house? Are we going to allow the dog on the furniture? Are we going to allow the dog to jump on us? Are we going to free feed our dog or are we going to feed the dog twice a day? How are we going to discipline the dog? How are we going to praise the dog? Are we doing treat training? Um, who's going to walk the dog and how much are we going to walk the dog? Um, you know, uh, so those are all elements that you need to kind of figure out from the beginning and be consistent with your dog. So from the very beginning, be loving, be nurturing, and also create like rules and boundaries because that, just like with children, it makes dogs feel safe. So, you know, right off the bat, when you're feeding your dog, if you put the food down, before you put the food down, hold it in your hand. And I do this with Jackson. He's a dog I'm fostering right now. I say, Jackson, sit. And he has to sit before I put that food down. And I say, okay. And then he can eat his food. It's creating boundaries. It's creating rules. It's creating so that you are the alpha. You are telling him what to do in a very gentle, kind way. And so it's reinforcing that you are the boss, which is a good thing. Um, so, you know, find ways that you can be creative in being like the boss, okay? Um, so, um, so, for example, um, you're going to take the dog for a walk. So, 
before you put the leash on the dog, have the dog sit and then put the leash on the dog. Then go to the door, have the dog sit before you open the door. Now, granted, if the dog doesn't even know what sit means, then you need to practice sit first with treats. That's the best way to do it. And you shape the dogs. You put the treat right here at their nose. And then you just like, almost like there's an invisible string pulling their nose up. So you pull up and then that kind of forces them into a sitting position and then give them the treat and praise them. That's called shaping. So that's a kind of a neat way that you can teach your dog to sit. So practice sit and then have your dog sit in different situations. Um, when you leave the house, to go to work or whatever you're doing, be very careful in the beginning not to create separation anxiety, okay? So I'll give you a, kind of an, an example. Um, so we took in a dog just yesterday. His name is Teddy. He's on a stray hold. Hi, Coca. Um, are you over there with, um, with uh, Tiger? Anyway, um, sorry, I'm distracted. Okay, so we took in a dog um, named that we named Teddy. And Teddy, I suspected right from the beginning that he had some separation anxiety. So what happens is, and we've had him for, oh gosh, just, um, I don't know, 24 hours, 48 hours, I don't know, just a day or two. And I could tell almost right away instinctually that he might have some separation anxiety. And so what's happening is, is that when he come, whenever we leave him, he barks like crazy. And then when we come back, he's so excited, he barks like crazy for an extended period of time. Now we've had him 24 hours or so. If he were, if we were a permanent home um, and we were surprised by this behavior, maybe he was found as a stray, we would be like, okay, what do we do about this behavior? Well, what I suspect happened is whoever owned him before, um, and again, he was found as a stray, but what I, I'm, I suspect is, is that every time they came and went from the house, they probably gave him tons of attention. And really the best thing to do is to just go about your business when you come and go from the house very casually and don't pay attention to the dog initially, because sometimes that can create anxiety and create this like need to be not separated from you. Um, and I have a suspicion that that may have been happening with Teddy. So it's happening actually more with my husband Chuck than it is with me where he's barking at Chuck more than me. And so um, what Chuck is doing is just ignoring the behavior and going about his business. And our hope is that at, over a period of a short per period of time, that when we don't give attention to that behavior, we don't fuel that fire, then it will dissipate. It will just go away on its own. And then Chuck is now praising um, uh, Teddy when Teddy is quiet and when he's not expecting attention. So he's trying to really reinforce positive behavior. So that would be kind of an example of uh, some of the things that you're gonna have to work on. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm getting uh, text messages about the babies as uh, the new, there's only still only one kitten that was born and mama is doing a very good job cleaning the baby off. So that's great. Okay, anyway, um, so that gives you kind of an idea. And you all have to understand, you have to expect that there are to be issues. Expect it, don't be surprised by it, but if you're prepared for it, then the, um, then you're not going to have the kind of uh, issues that you would if you're like blindsided or you expect that dog to be perfect when it comes in. Keep in mind that animal had a whole life before it came to your house and it doesn't speak English. It doesn't speak any language that we speak. We don't know what it went through. We don't know what its previous owners did or did not do for that dog. And you couple that with each dog is an individual. Each dog has its own emotions, its own feelings. Some are more sensitive than others. Some are very stoic. Um, some are needy, you know, whatever. Everybody, just like you and I are all different, is we have to anticipate that our doggy is gonna be different until we get to know them. Which leads to what we say in the animal rescue world, that an animal unpacks its bags. So I tell my foster families, because the foster families are like in the front lines, hey, be nice, you guys. Uh-uh. Oh, be nice. No, no. Be nice. Sorry, guys. Look at this. Whoop. Hang on. Be nice. Do you guys see that? 
I guess I wasn't supposed to do that. I guess I wasn't supposed to do that. Anyway, okay. So, um, so anyway, so you have to know that depending on the situation the dog came from, um, in a foster home, that foster family is actually doing a lot of the work to kind of get to know the dog um, so that it can transition to another home um, afterwards. We don't know when a dog comes in as a stray or even if they are actually given up by their owner. We don't know for sure what the background is of the dog. What we hope for is the owner's telling us the truth. Be nice. Hey, be nice to your kitten. That's not nice. That's not nice at all. Anyway, um, so you have to expect there to be some transitions and there could be transition from home to home as well. So sometimes we'll have where a foster family will experience one thing with the dog and then it goes to its new home and the new owners are experiencing something different. Different home, different people, different, um, different way people train dogs, the dog reacting to people differently, dogs bond to certain people more than others. Um, and so back to the unpacking their bags. We say in the rescue world that when we get a new animal in, it takes about two weeks for them to unpack their bags, for a dog to unpack their bags. So, hey, stop. Um, for, okay, so, so for them to unpack their bags in two weeks is, I would say, pretty average. So that's when you're gonna start, like in the beginning, think about this, okay? An animal is traumatized and their immediate um, reaction to being traumatized is to shut down. It makes sense from a um, survival instinct kind of scenario. So if they shut down, if they're quiet and they're reserved and they're, they don't do anything and they don't act a certain way, then what's going to happen is, is they're safer. Then if they make a lot of commotion and they're, you know, all out there, they're going to be much more a target, at least from an instinctual standpoint. So a lot of times they come into a new situation very shut down. Um, maybe they had, you know, were abused or neglected. Maybe they were in a bad situation. Maybe they were a backyard dog that never lived inside of a house. That's always interesting. Um, actually, there's a dog right now that we have named Maple. And she was found as a stray. She'd been running loose on and off in the Lake County area. And I suspect she was an outdoor dog that probably lived in a barn or whatever um, because she, this is her first experience being inside of a home. I can tell because she gets freaked out when she hears the blender or the, what, or the um, dishwasher when I turned on the, um, the, the sink the first time, all the doorways, the doors, everything seemed foreign to her. So she has to learn all those things. Again, that's unique to that dog. So when you get your new dog, you have to, you may have more information if the dog came from a foster home. That's an ideal situation. And let's say that foster family had that dog for, let's say a month, and they were able to do all the work that, that, that prepares the dog to get adopted. So, um, you know, they work on housebreaking, they work on manners for the dog, they get to know the dog's personality, you know, so that is a huge help. And that, that I mean, the foster families, by the way, rock. They are amazing. They are rock stars, um, the people that, that foster. It's just fabulous. So, um, so they prepare the dog as best they can, and then they hand the dog off to you, but there's still going to be transition. And we have to understand, we have to be... Uh, patient with our animals. You know, I hear stories about it taking years for a dog to adjust. I can tell you myself that I've fostered dogs where it takes them six months to really um, evolve into, um, into who they are. Um, it is so important that we not give up on these animals, okay? And that when you get a new dog, that you prepare yourself in advance. Know what your schedule is. Know that you're getting the, the right match for your home. Do your research. Take some time off before you, uh, you get your dog so that you have time to spend with your dog. Set rules and boundaries right away. Line up a trainer right away that could come to your home and help you with your dog. Okay, expect accidents, meaning pee and poo in the house. It is going to happen as they learn 
to go potty outside in your house. You know, it's a new environment. And if you had dogs before or you currently have dogs, they possibly are going to be marking in the house, lifting their leg in the house. And again, working with a trainer to help you to be able to transition the dog so that you have less accidents is hugely helpful. And certainly we don't want couches destroyed. We, want, we don't want the dogs eating things they're not supposed to be eating. So that's why it's vital that you put the dog in a space like a crate or a safe space that they cannot damage themselves or anything in your home. Really, really important, okay? Um, so then, I, then you say, well, what, what, um, you know, what would be enough time? Well, enough time is different for each individual and each dog um, and each situation. Sometimes you're gonna have a dog that you bring into the home and it's the second dog. You already have a dog and the two dogs are having a hard time um, uh, getting along. Maybe you had them do an initial introduction and um, it's just not going well at home. Give it time, give it time. And again, you're consulting with the trainer. Have the trainer come out and work with you with your dogs. Um, it's so important that we commit to the dog if we sign those adoption papers and we agree to take that dog home, that we will do everything in our power to be able to keep that animal. Now, there are some exceptions to that rule. There's exceptions to every rule out there. There's nothing that's black and white, okay? So there are, there are um, occasions when a dog might not be suitable for a particular home. I'll give you a scenario. So um, there was a young couple, really nice family, nice husband and wife that had a high energy terrier type dog, maybe 15 pounds. And they wanted to adopt a little puppy that we have named Bobby. And Bobby is kind of like a whimsical, fragile, little puppy. And um, we did have the dogs meet and um, while their dog was definitely assertive and playing hard, it seemed like they were gonna be able to work it out okay. And, um, and so they brought, they adopted Bobby and they brought Bobby home and they had Bobby, I think 48 hours, and their dog was like being vicious towards Bobby, just absolutely vicious. And um, they were having to keep him separated and it was escalating and getting worse. And so they made the decision to return Bobby. Um, I'm not gonna judge them for that. Um, now, they were one of the motivations that I had in, in doing this video is for people like that, that maybe they need more education up front to prepare them for um, being able to take in a dog. Maybe if they had been able to or thought of having an in-home trainer come and work with them. but. They planting that seed before the whole experience is a much better way to handle it than planting the seed after the house is in chaos and they're worried for Bobby and they're you know worried about the dynamic of their house and they're emotional about, about it. All the tools would have been in place beforehand if we had set them up for um, you know possibly having a trainer and and just some of the things that we've talked about here. So would they have still given up Bobby? I don't know, but certainly they might have had more information to be able to um, possibly uh, be able to keep them. I don't know, but I'm not judging them um, and their decision. I totally respect it. Um, but know that, that when, you, um, when you adopt a dog, that the better prepared you are and the more flexible you are to understand that as that dog unpacks its bags in your house and it adjusts to your house that you have to be forgiving of the mistakes the dog will make. No dog is perfect ever. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. No animal's perfect. We're going to make mistakes along the way and just have a really good sense of humor about it and, um, and really be, um, be uh, understanding um, that it is a process. And don't think that if let's say the dog, the first week you have it, it has five accidents in your house, meaning it pees in your house five times. You're going, oh my gosh, this dog is never gonna be housebroken. Okay, 
Well, first of all, take the word never out of your voc vocabulary. Never is just a really negative, toxic word because there is no such thing as negative. We don't know that. We don't have a crystal ball. And also try not to look at one week as an absolute because there's a heck of a lot of long weeks. If that dog is one year old or six months old or whatever, you've got 15 years of weeks um, for that dog and for housebreaking. So you're certainly not at a dead end and it's not, um, it's not, doesn't determine how the dog is going to be in the next week or the next month and certainly not the next year or the year after that. I hope this is all making sense, everybody. So now I want to take a break from talking for just a moment so that I can see if anybody has any questions about dogs and dogs adjusting to a new home and then we're going to segue to cats. Does anybody have any questions or comments? I see that Michelle is on and Michelle said, thanks for all the great info. Patience is so important and yes it is. And um, Michelle actually fostered quite a few um, dogs for us, probably I think 30 or 40 dogs, a lot. And she is one of my um, most experienced um, foster mommies of dogs. And um, she's the one that, I mean, I really, you know, I, she just does such a great job and she has the patience of a saint. And um, she has turned around so many dogs and there's like 30 or 40 dogs all over the Midwest that were originally in her home that are now living wonderful lives. So it's absolutely awesome and amazing. And that's what it takes is a lot of patience and hard work. Um, Jane says, thanks for the info, Sandy. You are welcome. You are very, very welcome. Okay, let's see. I see Laura's here. I'm, I know I'm probably missing people um, as far as who's, he, who's on, but hello, everybody. I'm, I'm not uh, singling people out um, to say hi to. It's just whoever I see on my list here. So any other questions? I hope I'm covering it. Um, Michelle, is there anything that you want to add that I missed? Um, or anybody else that um, that knows a lot about dogs transitioning um, into a new home. Any other tips that I've missed? Um, I'm you know happy. Bring it on. Bring it on because it's possible I missed something. Um, and again, I'm doing this live because I really want to help educate people up front before they adopt, so that that they can be better prepared to be able to handle anything that might come up for their dog when they adopt their dog. So hopefully people will start watching this in our website um, so before they adopt so that they can be better prepared. Um, Teresa said, I'm gonna try ignoring when I get home. Good, 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 good. I have a small terrier mix who has little man syndrome, but he's not aggressive. What's the best way to introduce him to a new bigger dog? Um, you know what, Jane, that is more of a dog training question than it is what's our topic tonight. And I don't want to veer off simply because I have limited time. Right now I've got a dog that was hit by a car that um, Coca's kindly taking some time with, but I want to be able to stop in and say hi to her. I also have a mama cat that is uh, having a litter of kittens right now, so um, I can't really get into um, into actual specifics of individual people's pets and what you know what behavior issues. But Jane, what I would recommend that you do is once a month I do a live um, where I talk all about dog training, and it's on a Saturday morning. I would totally come to that live if I were you and address me on that question again. Um, okay, so Michelle said, you've covered a, a ton. Nothing else I can think of. Fostering is so rewarding. Yeah, that's true. Um, okay, Barbara says, think I've been through all your scenarios between my eight dogs over the years and after 15 fosters. The shutdown fosters were the toughest, but the most rewarding. Um, training is mandatory for the new owners as much as the dog. Good. That's awesome. Um, yes, Ala. Um, Friday is having kittens. You can contact Michelle and Julie. They are together helping, um, helping um, Friday have her kittens. So if you want to call them. Um, okay. So yeah, Jane, I will definitely address your issue. Um, when we're talking about dog training and not transitioning a dog into a new home. Okay, so can we segue now, everyone? Let's segue to cats and cats adjusting to a new home. Um, 
One of the biggest mistakes that people make when they bring a new cat into the house is to just throw it with the rest of the animals in the house, okay? Not to keep it separate in the beginning, okay? You are setting yourself up for your cat up for failure. There's many reasons why you want your cat to be the new cat, whether it's a kitten or an adult, you want it to be in a separate room by itself for an extended period of time. If it's a kitten, it needs to be in that room. It could be somewhere between 24 hours up to a week or two weeks or three weeks. Again, depending on if you have other cats, and I'm just assuming you have other cats in the house or other dogs, assuming how everybody is like reacting to each other through the door, okay? But adult cats, meeting adult cats is that much more challenging. And sometimes it can take a long time for them to actually adjust like the new cat to be accepted by the cats that are in the house. I do this all the time, everyone, all the time. I take in homeless cats every day. And they like the room that we're in right now is my meditation yoga room, and now it's become my studio for doing lives. I have two cats in here right now, and they're getting adopted tomorrow. It's a cat and a kitten, so, um, so I, I won't introduce them to the other cats in the house. But I will tell you that often, 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 we have a, a setup in here, and you could see, well, you can't see, but there's cat towers in here. There's lots of things, cushy things for the cats to lay on, um, things to you know interest them. There's toys, there's food, there's water, and of course, a litter box. Um, and so um, they have a lot to entertain themselves and slowly, slowly, slowly introduce them. Um, and people under, don't understand the concept of time when it comes to um, introducing cats to cats. That we're not talking about 24 hours in most cases. For adult cat to adult cat, you if you take it slow, really, really slow, and when I say really slow, I'm talking about two weeks, three weeks, a month, two months, um, you can slowly transition the new cat to be able to live in harmony with the cat that you currently have. I have found that doing it that way, you have the best success. And we wanna really, really stress that, um, that when you get a new cat in the house is that another reason you wanna keep them in a small space to begin with is because you want them to get used to where their litter box is and then you want them to use their litter box. So if it's an adult cat, she's having a good time using her litter box right now. If it's an adult cat and it's just one cat, just have one litter box and have the, the cat in a box, and the, have the, the box in the room with the cat, scoop the cat litter, make sure the cat is going potty in the litter box, make sure it's nice and clean at all times, and then you're good to go if after like three or four days, the cat's going in the box, it's not an issue, it's not going on, cat beds or on um, the floor or wherever and it's going in the litter box and um, and then you can slowly like when you're home you can let the cat have the run of wherever you are um, you know while you're home like it maybe can stay in the living room with you and maybe you have a litter box and you know like in the corner in the living room but you, you allow the, ca the cat to be in the living room and then again assuming it's new to living with you when you go to work for the day, put the cat back in its bedroom for the day. You don't want to give a, a cat a the run of the entire um, house right from the get-go because you really want to make sure they're trained to use the litter box. Okay, really, really important. Um, so uh, those would be some of the things that, that you want to look out for with new cats in your house. Also, it is not uncommon for a new cat when they first come to hide. So that's another reason you want them to be in a in just a room and not run of the whole house. Cause can you imagine if you let a cat loose in your house from the get go and it's gonna hide? You won't even know where it is. You may not see it for months. If it has the ability to hide and it's a scared cat, it's going to hide. So really, really important, okay? Um, so um, so an another reason to have the cat in a room by itself um, for a period of time until it adjusts, okay? 
Um, the other thing too is you want to see is my new cat scratching on things it's not supposed to scratch on. Well, again, you don't want it in the entire house where it can scratch up your beautiful furniture. So instead you want to clip the nails, you want to make sure that you, um, that you encourage the cat through catnip sprinkled on like cat towers and on scratching posts and things like that. You want to encourage that kind of scratching and you want to discourage scratching where they shouldn't. Like for instance, my poor curtains. I love these curtains, but I'm not in here enough to see the cats all destroying it. It's all destroyed, unfortunately. Um, if it mattered that much to me, I would have like, you know, not had them in here or whatever, but it doesn't matter that much to me. But in any case, um, you want to make sure that so you don't have things destroyed in your house, that you make sure that they're using um, their nails appropriately in the right places. And the best way to monitor that, again, is to start in a small space. And then if, let's say, in the beginning you're going to have the cat with you in the living room while you're watching TV and it's sitting on your lap or whatever and it starts to scratch, it jumps down, starts to scratch the furniture, then you, you, no, 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 like that, you know, or whatever you have to do, and then redirect the cat to where it's supposed to scratch, okay? So, um, and uh, being consistent with what you expect from your cat is really important. Cats are obviously much more independent than, um, than, uh, than dogs are, um, and they don't train as well um, as, uh, as um, dogs do, um, as far as like sit, stay, calm, they don't go for walks, things like that. But certainly, now the kitten, now the baby kitten is going potty in the box. Good kitties. Um, any case, in any way, um, all really important things um, when you're dealing with a new cat. And no too, just like with a dog, with a cat, you have to give them time to adjust. And it's not 24 hours, it's not 48 hours. If you, have, if you adopted a shy, cat, a shy cat, bless your heart, by the way, because those are the hardest ones to find homes for. Bless your heart if you adopt a shy cat. They don't show well at shelters, they don't show well at foster homes, and they take a lot of work and a lot of time, and those are the cats that need um, to get into permanent homes. And so know that that cat will end up being such a loving cat to you if you take the time for them and don't expect them to become dog-like and don't expect them to come running into your arms in the beginning. It could take a month, two months, six months, and just enjoy the experience that you have with the cat um, in a different way and know that, you, you know, that it, the rewards that you're going to get for that cat will be great in the long run. Okay, so then another thing really, 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 really important with cats, make sure you have enough litter boxes, people. So important. If you have two cats, you need three litter boxes, okay? If you have the space for it. If you don't, then two litter boxes um, for sure, okay? If you have one cat, in an ideal world, have two litter boxes in two different places so the cat has options. Um, clean that litter box every day, two to three times a day, okay? Speaking of, they pooped in the box and it stinks in here. Luckily, you guys can't smell it. Um, but in any case, um, make, make sure that you have enough litter boxes. And if you're noticing that your cat's having accidents um, outside the box, um, there's lots of things that you can do for that as well. But again, setting yourself up for success for your cat. There is a video on our Facebook page, uh, not Facebook, on our website that I would encourage you if you're having litter box issues with your cat. I did a whole live on litter box issues for cats. I encourage you to watch it. It gives you all sorts of tips on how to deal with that. Um, I see uh, Jean came on board. Hi, Jean. Um, and so uh, those are some of the tips I can think about for cats. Does anybody have anything to add as far as cats are concerned or any suggestions you have, what's worked for you, um, any questions for me? Um, we'll see if anybody says anything. And then when we're going to wrap it up because I still have a very busy night ahead of me. Um, lots of stuff going on 
and you and also keep an eye on future posts that we're going to do because um friday the cat is having her kittens right now i don't know how many have been born but um, i know they're sending me pictures because i'm seeing them on my texting and so i'll send everybody pictures so you can see um the new babies and um yeah and all that We've got lots going on and i know coco's down there trying to get um she's in the office trying to get a uh, tiger the dog that was hit by a car she's trying to get him to eat um he has yet to eat for me I, she said she stopped at mcdonald's and got some hamburgers and usually that works we just need him to eat something at this point um okay i'm not seeing any questions so what i'm hoping is if there's no questions there's no comments um that hopefully i covered everything okay here we got a question uh vicky says do you do cat behavior problems on saturday session um i don't it's all about dog training on that saturday session but certainly absolutely <coughs> i can do a whole live on on cat behavior i'm happy to do that um in the future so we can definitely schedule that i'm doing more and more lives and to hope to educate the public um Oh, Coca said that um, that Tiger is eating and he is demanding attention. Yay! Okay, so I have to give this plug, um, and it's shameless plug, is that Animal Education and Rescue provides these educational programs to the public so that we can educate people, so that people take better care of their animals. There's less homeless animals. People spay and neuter their animals. And educating people will help situations so that an animal can live a wonderful life with a family and there's less um, abuse and neglect and frustrated owners and I am asking um, for any donations that you are able and willing to donate towards our educational programs um, my time is valuable um, obviously we're putting it on our website we're asking you to um, share this far and wide um, so that we can continue to help people to be the best possible pet owners they can be. So any donations you can make to our website, um, there's a link right um, on our website. You can donate towards our educational programs or towards this particular educational program um, that we just put on this evening. So um, anyway, I guess that's it for now. Hopefully I was able to share something with you that maybe you didn't know before and um, I am really grateful for you and for your support of our organization and for all the educational programs that we do. I'm also very grateful if you would again share this so that we can continue to pass the message along so less animals um, are homeless and more animals stay in their homes forever. Okay, so you all have a wonderful evening. Keep an eye on Facebook and we will keep you posted on what's going on and there's lots of stuff going on right now. So you all have a great night. Sleep well. Talk to you later. Bye.